Hello again and welcome to another episode of What's Up Prof. Good day, Walter. Hi, Martin. Well, I'm doing very well and it's, I hope you are doing well as well. I think uh, the Lord is good to us, right? It's amazing. So today, interesting topic again, a little bit about the spirit of prophecy and what the Bible gave criteria for the remnant church for. Yes, let's have a talk about uh, disguised infidelity. Mm. Now, Martin, isn't it interesting how the philosophies of the world impact our thinking? Definitely. It, I mean, you cannot even think of anything that you be, have been taught in school that didn't affect your thinking. And where does that come from? It comes from the philosophies. So basically, if your foundation is built on a philosophy, then you've built it on sand, right? True. It must be built on a thus says the Lord. But uh, let's not run ahead of ourselves. Will you pray for us? I will. Our Heavenly Father, thank you once again for bringing us together. Thank you for giving us an anchor in our life, the Bible. We ask that you enlighten our minds with the Holy Spirit and we also bless this discussion. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Now, once again, let's make it quite plain. We do not uh, want to do these things to be overly critical about what people say, etc. But if it affects people's decisions as to whether they want to uh, stay within the realm of what we believe or whether they should rather depart the scene, mm -hmm. it becomes very important that we say, no matter what happens, there is truth. And as long as truth prevails, no matter how small the percentage that adheres to it, then truth has not been cast aside. Oh, you no, know, it's such a relief. When in my previously in my life, I always would yearn to have the complete truth. And now, in the past few years, been studying the Seventh Day Adventist doctrines and the Bible together, and learning that there is a remnant with a prophet at the end, according to the Bible. And you start studying that prophet. It was such a relief to get this unadulterated truth and implement it in, in, in my life. I also found, Martin, that when I read the Bible and I, I read the way in which the prophets expressed themselves and the Bible writers, mm. and then I pick up uh, the Spirit of Prophecy volumes and I read in those and I find exactly the same spirit. And in my life, I've had the misfortune of reading literally hundreds of infidel books, mm. spiritualistic books, occult books, and that spirit is totally different. And I was so schooled in it that it took me quite a while to get rid of it. Mm. Yeah, well, it took Moses 40 years. Yes, and once, once I had made the transition, mm. When I pick up a book and I read and I find that spirit, it, I immediately become nauseated. Mm. And uh, I, I have developed an aversion to that other spirit. And it's like you can recognize it even in the dark, mm. just from the way in which the words are strung together. Correct. God, is, God is a God of love, but he's not wishy-washy. Mm -mm. He's straightforward, and he has such wonderful sayings, and he says it in so <laughs> such a nice way, but it hits home. It's true, yeah. When he rebukes the Israelites, for example, and he says, I did this for you, and you didn't listen. I did that, and I punished you with this, and I punished you with that, and still you wouldn't listen, and I gave you cleanness of teeth, and you wouldn't listen. Uh, who would put it like that? Exactly. There's no food in your mouth. You've yeah. got cleanness of teeth. You know, it's such, it's so amazing. I love it. And 
That's why the reason I'm also saying this is I want to encourage people. Read the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. Yes, because the one won't take you away from the other. No. They will only augment each other. And this is, this is the wall. And that is why we're going to discuss this today. Yes, the straight testimony will cause the shaking. This is a war as to whom will you believe. Will you believe the philosophies? Will you believe those that run with the philosophies? Or will you believe with us, says the Lord? Amen. That's the bottom line. That's it. We're going to read a few quotes from uh, a particular chapter in Spiritual Gifts, Volume 3, from page 90. I was then carried back to the creation and was shown that the first week in which God performed the work of creation in six days and rested on the seventh day was just like every other week. The great God in his days of creation and day of rest measured off the first cycle as a sample for successive weeks till the close of time. Quote, these are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created. God gives us the productions of his work at the close of each literal day. Each day was accounted of him a generation, because every day he generated or produced some new portion of his work. On the seventh day of the first week, God rested from his work and then blessed the day of his rest and set it apart for the use of man. The weekly cycle of seven literal days, six for labor and the seventh for rest, which has been preserved and brought down through Bible history, originated in the great fact of the first seven days. That is the basis of the entire plan for humanity. That's it. Everything happened in that one week with literal days. Now if we look at this statement and we read the Bible and it says, and it was evening and it was morning the first day. And it was evening and it was morning the second day. And in the first days, he created the spaces. And in the last portion of the week, he filled the spaces. Mm -hmm. And the crowning act was humanity. And once that had been completed and the animals had been named and Eve was created, then the creation was complete and they could rest in the completed works of God. Yeah. That's the basis, right? Now, when we look at modern science, how much of it do they accept? Nothing. Nothing. All right. Now, I've been at our faith and science meetings, and I look at many of our theologians, and I see that many of our scientists and theologians and educated people, even from the medical world, that many of them don't believe it either. Yeah. Look at this now. The Bible in Genesis puts it just as straightforward as we've just read in this first par paragraph. How much science does it need now to get rid of all of this? It takes a whole universal uh, science that has infiltrated every single aspect of humanity. Everything out there has an evolutionary bias. Whether you're talking in the media, whether you're talking in the scientific fraternity, or whether you're talking in the religious fraternity, everything has an evolutionary bias. Medical fraternity as well. And God's people are supposed to be separate and have a different tune. Now, if we look at the modern science, for example, of what's happening in virology, Everything is based on evolution. Yeah. In fact, the evolutionary scientists with mutations in the viral field are the ones that are running the modern medical world. And according to this, it's based on sand, a foundation that is built on sand. It's a card house, mm. and it will collapse it at some stage. 
So very important that it was literal days. Now our uh, prominent people have such an aversion to this word literal. Yeah. Uh, I could mention the names, but I, I shall refrain. But let us say that they are our professors at universities, rectors at universities, and leading figures in the theological field. And they have an aversion to this very first plain statement, which is not only in the spirit of prophecy, but directly in the first words of the book of Genesis. Yeah. With that as basis, let's continue reading. When God spake his law with an audible voice from Sinai, he introduced the Sabbath by saying, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. He then declared, definitely, definitely, if you like, what shall be done on the sixth day and what shall not be done on the seventh. He then, in giving the reason for thus observing the week, points them back to his example on the first seven days of time. For in six days the Lord made the heaven, the earth, and the sea, and all that in them is, and rested on the seventh day, wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. This reason appears beautiful and forcible when we understand the record of creation to mean literal days. The first six days of each week are given to man in which to labor because God employed the same period of the first week in the work of creation. The seventh day God had reserved as a day of rest in commemoration of his rest during the same period of time after he had performed the work of creation in six days. There is so much theology in this that it is mind-boggling. Righteousness by faith is ensconced in those statements. Uh, the whole issue of finding rest in God mm -hmm. is ensconced in this statement. So if you do not have this basis, then you have no rest, therefore you are restless. Exactly, and you continue to be restless, so you have to think up and dig up stuff to, con to um, substantiate what you're trying to say. Yes, yeah, so that you can continually remain restless. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, when I, when I think about myself, I mean, I was an evolutionist, as everybody at nausea knows by now. And I came across the Sabbath, I said to myself, this is ridiculous, I can't keep the Sabbath in commemoration of six literal days of creation. Therefore, this whole Sabbath doesn't make any sense. If it applies to long ages, then uh, when you study that through, that doesn't make any sense either, because how did the plants survive without a sun for millennia and millennia and millennia? And how did uh, the marine animals and the birds appear before the land animals? And you have a total confusion. Nothing works. Yes. So you must throw the baby and the bathwater out of the window. So nothing makes sense until you understand that there were six little days and the Sabbath is a commemoration and that it is a week of time. We'll get to that a little bit yeah. later. Okay. But the infidel, <laughs> this is what we're dealing with, right? Correct. So what's the opposite of believing that? Infidelity. Infidelity. Now, if you go to a Jesuit university, what will you be taught? Truth or infidelity? Infidelity. So if you are taught infidelity, then what can you become other than an infidel, right? That's it. <laughs> but the infidel supposition that the events of the first week required seven vast indefinite periods for their accomplishment strikes directly at the foundation of the Sabbath of the fourth commandment. It makes indefinite and obscure that which God has made very plain. It is the worst kind of infidelity. So, Martin, is it possible to find the worst kind of infidelity even in our own ranks? Unfortunately, it is, yes. Hmm. And that's what the sad thing is. And that's why I would encourage everybody, before you swallow anything that anybody has to say, read this Bible and spirit of prophecy, and compare it if that what comes out of the mouth 
is in line with it. And if they speak not according to this word? There's no light in them. Okay. So that's the worst kind of infidelity. For with many who profess to believe the record of creation, it is infidelity in disguise. It charges God with commanding men to observe the week of seven literal days in commemoration of seven indefinite periods, which is unlike his dealings with mortals and is an impeachment of his wisdom. It's very well put, right? Mm -hmm. You so, actually make God an idiot if you try and say that he created all of this in millions of years and he says he did it in days. Now, why would you want to say that? Because the world has indoctrinated everyone to believe that that is true, right? So let's continue with this chapter. Infidel geologists claim that the world is very much older than the Bible record makes it. Now we come again to this issue of time, which is such a bane and such a pain. And can be such a relief if you just accept it. Yes, depending on what side of this <laughs> fence you want to stand. Now, you know, when I started off with this and I was an atheist, I had all the worldly wisdom, all the... But! <laughs> what nonsense are you talking? You know, we have thousands of years of history. Egyptian chronology tells us, you know, we're dealing with thousands, at least 10,000 and Chinese mythology goes back, woo, even before that, etc., etc. And uh, the more you studied it, the more you realized that that foundation is built on sand. Exactly. You see, they had taken the Egyptian chronology and put it in a sequential sequence, mm. whereas many of those kings were actually co-regents, yeah. father and son, ruling different areas mm -hmm. of the same kingdom. And the more knowledge men received, eventually they got to the point where from 10,000, they say plus minus 3,000 mm -hmm. BC. They don't even say more than 3,000, plus, minus. So everything, the more you studied it, the more it comes into harmony. Yep. Now, you know, Martin, just think about this. According to this old chronology, humanity has been around for uh, plus minus two million years, right? Just in my lifetime, the population of humanity has soared from four billion to seven to eight billion and is heading towards 9 billion. If you start with one pair, how long before you have this world's population? Well, if you do a little calculation and you take the, the growth rates and you take death and disease and everything into account, then we're dealing with a few thousand years. We're not dealing with millions of years or even tens of thousands of years. And uh, there are so many examples, you know, within our uh, modern history, one little pair of rabbits <laughs> ends up in Australia and ravages the place and you have billions of rabbits. They devastate them with poisons and almost wipe them out and within just a decade or two they have another billion. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't take so long. So then they come with uh, radiometric dating. Well, radiometric dating is based on suppositions. So you have a a priori assumption. For example, that when you want to date a material, there must be a time when it was zero. Mm -hmm. It's like a stopwatch, yeah. like a clock. You know, if you want to know how quickly someone runs around the field, you must have a start and you must have an end. Now, when you don't have a clock, but you're working with isotopes, then you must have a time when there were no daughter isotopes, and that's your zero reset. So you set your clock on that, and your assumption is 
that when you have volcanic material, for example, appearing, that that clock is set to zero. Mm. But it never is, because if you do an analysis, it can read up to hundreds of millions of years. So, Martin, if you have a stopwatch and you're testing how quick someone runs around the track and the stopwatch starts at 40 seconds, then... It's not going to work. No, it's useless, right? Yeah. It's pathetic. Okay. So, there are many things like this. So, infidel geologists claim that the world is very much older than the Bible record makes it. They reject the Bible record because of those things which are to them evidences from the earth itself. That the world has existed tens of thousands of years. Let's make that billions. Mm. And many who profess to believe the Bible record are at a loss to account for wonderful things which are found in the earth which the view that creation week was only seven literal days and that the world is now only about 6,000 years old, these, to free themselves of difficulties thrown in their way by infidel geologists, adopt the view that the six days of creation were six vast indefinite periods. And the day of God's rest was another indefinite period, making senseless the fourth commandment of God's holy law. It's interesting to link that these infidel geologists try to get rid of the 6,000 years. And they try to get rid of the Sabbath without them knowing it. Without them knowing. So when you are in, on the side and saying that Okay, it's not millions, but ten thousands of years, but this six thousand thing can't work. Then you're putting yourself on the infidel side. Yes, you're making a compromise between truth and error. You are drinking a co concoction with a dose of poison in it. And you're thinking you're very smart mm. in the process. Okay, so some eagerly receive this position, for it destroys the fourth commandment. And they feel a freedom from its claims upon them. They have limited ideas of the size of men, animals and trees before the flood and of the great changes which then took place in the earth. Uh, that's a very interesting one. There's a law in evolution which was called the law of Carroll which simply states that evolution must proceed from small to large. Mm. It doesn't proceed from large to small. Now that's eminently logical. You don't start the evolutionary process with an elephant and end with an amoeba. You start with the unicellular and you end with the elephant. So obviously you're going from small to large. Because if you had to assume that the animals were huge from the beginning, then you'd have to ask, whoa, how did that come about? That must be a stroke of magic, right? Hmm. So everything has to go from small to large. And now, you look in the fossil record, and everything in the fossil record is much bigger than what it is now. So all the animals, whether you're talking about the wolf, whether you're talking about a sloth, whether you're talking about an elephant, whether you're talking about a rhinoceros, no matter what animal you look at, whether you're looking at the insect world, they were infinitely larger mm. than what they are today. That's the reversal. Yeah. So looking at it, then you have to assume that we haven't evolved, we've devolved. Mm. We've become degenerate. Now that is perfectly in harmony with the Bible. Yes. We were a perfect creation. Adam was about three meters tall. And now we are shrimps and think that we are brilliant mm. and advanced, right? Yeah. But we've degenerated. If we just take our teeth, we have so many spare teeth that we have to pull some of them. Wisdom teeth and all of those things. So uh, they must have had much larger jaws than we had and I'm sure all the teeth fitted. So this is a very interesting thing. So when you look at the fossil record, you find exactly the opposite to what their theory professes. Mm. And the other thing is, if evolution is true, and somewhere in the nebulous past, life somehow happened to evolve, 
then surely there was a very low diversity of life, one little life form that developed. And out of that, all the diversity must have evolved. So when you go to the fossil record, you should find low diversity in the beginning and vast diversity at the end. But why do you find the exact opposite? Huge diversity in the beginning with a degeneration and decline to today. That's the reverse of what you would expect. So one of the two is lying. Mm. Either the infidel geologist is lying and the infidel evolutionist is lying and the infidel anybody else who accepts their testimony mm -hmm is a co-partner in lying, or the Bible is lying. You can choose. Pick and choose. I'll take my chance with the Bible. Bones of men and animals are found in the earth, in mountains and in valleys, showing that much larger men and beasts once lived upon the earth. You know, Martin, it's almost like I'm preempting what it is saying here. But this is something that has always been fascinating. Take the dinosaurs. Mm massive creatures, or the mastodons, or any one of them, or the giant sloth. We don't see those creatures today. But in some cases, like in the case of the giant sloth, for example, we find their skins mm. still intact. But if they've been extinct for millions and millions of years, then that is an impossibility. Mm. Nevertheless, we find them. And then we find fossils of men, like Grauballer man, 2.7 meters tall. Mm. Uh, what is going on here? There's something mysterious, something seriously wrong. Yeah. You know what? And also interesting to me is she's mentioning the, the, these much larger men. And the Bible talks about giants. And now people run away with the word that they use for giants, Nephilim. And they say this is a hybrid between a fallen angel and human beings. It's, it's impossible in the first place. And secondly, Adam was a giant. Absolutely. He was over three meters. He was the tallest of them all. Yeah. So that, the race in those days were these giant men. The giants were, that were involved there in the early times, the word Nephilim also means apostate. Exactly. So they were all giants, and you had the descendants of those that followed the line of Adam and Zeth, and you had the line that followed the line of Cain. Mm -hmm. And those were the daughters where the daughters of men came from. And eventually, the sons of God, who were the descendants that clung to the truth, they went to the mall and they saw all of these beautiful, well-proportioned, very large <laughs> ladies <laughs> and uh, with their short little mini dresses. And they saw that they were beautiful and that's where the rot ended. Yeah. But of course, if you prefer the Catholic-approved Bibles, then you have this nonsense that angelic beings that cannot mm -hmm. procreate even because some people now want to try and put it, yes, but the fallen angel took on human form. No, no, no. This, then it's not an angel that procre uh, procreated. It was a human still. Yes. Even if, so there's no logic in this whole um, thinking. No logic, and it's very simple. The descendants of God's line of people eventually intermingled with those that had lost faith in God, and that is where the rot has set in. And God, you know, God told his people in the days of Israel, don't intermingle with the other nations. It wasn't a question that it was forbidden to marry someone from another race or another people. It was not to intermingle with those that didn't have the same religious conviction because you would be drawn down, and history proves that's what happened to Solomon, that's what happened to all of them. And uh, Ruth, for example, was a Moabitess. God strictly forbade any union with the Moabites. 
But she wasn't a Moabitess anymore because she said, your God will be my God Mm. and your people will be my people. And therefore, she's even in the line of Christ. So we need to read these things properly. Mm. I was shown that very large, powerful animals existed before the flood, which do not now exist. Instruments of warfare are sometimes found, also petrified wood, because the bones of human beings and of animals found in the earth are much larger than those of men and animals now living or that have existed for many generations past. Some conclude that the world is older than we have any scriptural record of and was populated long before the record of creation by a race of beings vastly superior in size to men now upon the earth. So you have all these theories of a double creation. Mm -hmm. And there was first something and then it was destroyed and then you have the Adam and Eve story and you have all of these compromises. No, there was one creation. They were giant people, they were large. If you take the petrified forests, if you take the coal fields of the world, these are huge trees and things which were buried and all of the animals which were so huge and large. They testify of a perfect different creation in the sense of a superior creation which has degenerated Mm -hmm. over time. Just take uh, the pre-flood generation. They all almost became 900 or more years old. Mm -hmm. Immediately post-flood it drops to 400 and something. Mm -hmm. By the time you get to Abraham it's 180. By the time you get to Moses it's 120. By the time you get to David it's 17. If you're lucky it's 80. I have been shown that without Bible history, geology can prove nothing. Relics found in the earth do give evidence of a state of things differing in many respects from the present. But the time of their existence and how long a period these things have been in the earth are only to be understood by Bible history. And Martin, you cannot date fossils. It is a misnomer. You can date the rocks around the fossils, but even then you have an assumption which is not necessarily valid as a starting point. So dating is basically meaningless unless it is of a very specific known period. Just take how important this statement is. If your understanding of the age of anything is transcending the 6,000 year period, you run into a problem because that's what the Bible says. You come into conflict with With Scripture. Yeah. Now, we've had many discussions like this and I'm sure our viewers are -hmm. are beginning to see where we're going to go with this. If you start messing with this 6,000 year period, then you run the risk of infidelity. That's the problem. Mm Mm-hmm. It may be innocent to conjecture beyond Bible history if our suppositions do not contradict the fact found in the sacred scriptures. But when men leave the word of God in regard to the history of creation and seek to account for God's creative works upon natural principles, they are upon a boundless ocean of uncertainty. Just how God accomplished the work of creation in six literal days, he has never revealed to mortals. His creative works are just as incomprehensible as his existence. And then she quotes from the Bible. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable, which doeth great things past finding out, yea, and wonders without number, which doeth great things and unsearchable, marvelous things without number, God thundereth marvelously with his voice. Great things doeth he, which we cannot comprehend. O oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Isn't it interesting that humanity is so much cleverer than God? And they continue to grow even more 
intelligent. So if we continue with this chapter, the Word of God is given as a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Those who cast His Word behind them and seek by their own blind philosophy to trace out the wonderful mysteries of Jehovah will stumble in darkness. So Martin, let's just get this straight. Anything that contradicts this written word is a philosophy. That's it. A guide has been given to mortals whereby they may trace Jehovah and his works as far as will be for their good. Inspiration, in giving us the history of the flood, has explained wonderful mysteries that geology, independent of inspiration, never could. Now, I was, I was there. I was an evolutionist. Mm -hmm. I used to go on field trips with students and look at the geological record. And we have a marvelous geological record in South Africa. And we have the Karoo fields with all the dinosaurs. And we have all those ages and those vast fossil fields of marine organisms, the Eka, for example. And I was always fascinated how perfectly these fossils are preserved and how they lie in mass graves. And I was told that these were local floods that had buried them. Local floods over entire continents? Mm. That doesn't make any sense whatsoever. And I went to the petrified forests, both here in Namibia and on Mount Hornaday in Yellowstone National Park and all of these places. And they're stream orientated, even the upright ones. Mm. So the evidence for a universal flood is overwhelming. Yeah. And then you have the chalk layer, Martin, mm. which is universal, which means everything was underwater. But they have to dilly dally and step around these things that's because the, they don't have an answer. That's the thing. You have to have volumes and volumes of books to try and negate what the Bible just said is plain and simple. Correct. You are absolutely right. It has been the special work of Satan to lead fallen man to rebel against God's government and he has succeeded too well in his efforts. He has tried to obscure the law of God, which in itself is very plain. He has manifested a special hate against the fourth precept of the Decalogue, because it defines the living God, the maker of heaven and earth. The plainest precepts of Jehovah are turned from to receive infidel fables. So there we have the word infidelity again. Mm -hmm. And why has he got such a hatred for the fourth commandment? Because that's the one that sets the creator of everything at the authority. Yes, he's the authority. And that's the word that bugs him. Mm. That little word, authority. And he wants to set up his own authority. Man will be left without excuse. God has given sufficient evidence upon which to base faith if he wish to believe. In the last days, the earth will be almost destitute of true faith. Have, have we reached that point? Yes. Upon the merest pretense, the word of God will be considered unreliable. Martin, what if you put so many versions of God's word out there that nothing can be reliable? That's a, a very good plan from the enemy. Hmm. While human reasoning will be received, though it be in opposition to the plain scripture facts, Men will endeavor to explain from natural causes the work of creation, which God has never revealed. But human science cannot search out the secrets of the God of heaven and explain the stupendous works of creation, which were a miracle of almighty power, any sooner than it can show how God came into existence. The only reason I know that God exists is because I exist. That's it. Right? Now Descartes said, I think therefore I am, mm. making himself God. <laughs> yeah. He should have said, I am, therefore I think. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> then it would have been better for him, right? So, But that's the way of Jesuit thinking. 
they will always twist. Descartes, of course, was Jesuit and Jesuit trained. And uh, they and their infidel theology and philosophy are at the root of much of this evil in the world. That's it. And they are at the root <coughs> of higher criticism. So that's why you sit with all this nonsense of, oh, but we can't take the Bible literally. We can't do this. We can't do that. Where we can't go back to a thus saith the Lord. Correct. So if there is if there is no foundation, then how can you build a proper building? I mean, if you want to prove to the world evolution does not exist, why not why aren't you allowed to use the Bible? All right, what have we established so far? Because we're not gonna just talk about evolution creation here, right? We have established that there is a certain foundation. And if you take this word, Martin, and you pick it up, and you open it up at the book of Genesis, and you start with those words, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. That's a stupendous way to start a revelation from God, right? Exactly. You come from somewhere, mm -hmm. and God says, he did it. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said. And then it goes, God did this, God said, God did, God said, God did, God said, God did. And he's talking about Elohim, a plural. Mm -hmm. Therefore, the Godhead was in this creation process. If we continue our, our reading here, the secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever. Men professing to be ministers of God raise their voices against the investigation of prophecy and tell the people that the prophecies, especially of Daniel and John, are obscure and that we cannot understand them. So now, Martin, we're moving from the purely physical to the spiritual. Yeah. Now, if the creation account is obscure and needs to be redefined, maybe we must redefine the prophecies. But that's what happens. Huh? Isn't that what they're doing? Exactly, and then you go into infidelity. Now, who's doing this? Men who are supposed to be religious teachers within God's people right okay but some of the very men who oppose the investigation of prophecy because it is obscure eagerly receive the supposition of geologists which dispute the mosaic record but if god's revealed will is so difficult to be understood certainly men should not rest their faith upon mere suppositions in regard to that which he has not revealed god's ways are not as our ways neither are his thoughts as our thoughts. All right, so this doesn't just stay with the physical and with geologists, no. but that's where the rot starts. Exactly. Human science can never account for his wondrous works. God so ordained that men, beasts, and trees, many times larger than those now upon the earth and other things, should be buried in the earth at the time of the flood, and there be preserved to evidence to man that the inhabitants of the old world perished by a flood. God designed that the discovery of these things in the earth should establish the faith of men in inspired history. Now, isn't it interesting that throughout the ages, godly people believed that what you found in the rocks was evidence of a flood? Mm -hmm. Yes, that's how it was supposed to be. And then came Darwin. Mm. And it's interesting, he sent out his first draft in 1844. Mm. So this is particularly for the last generation, mm. to confuse them utterly. Now, the reformers, they believed in the creation and they believed in the flood. Mm. But our modern scientists don't. And many of our theologians don't, and many of our religious leaders don't. 
But men with their vain reasoning make a wrong use of these things which God designed should lead them to exalt him. They fall into the same error as did the people before the flood. Those things which God gave them as a benefit, they turned into a curse by making a wrong use of them. And when the foundations of the earth were laid, then was also laid the foundation of the Sabbath. So you cannot divorce the Sabbath from the creation. No, and, and vice versa. So when you destroy creation in six little days, you go to evolution and millions of years or even thousands of years, you destroy the Sabbath. So Martin, do you keep the seventh day as a Sabbath? Yes. But you're keeping a Jewish Sabbath. Mm. No, I'm keeping a godly Sabbath that was instituted in Genesis already. Long before there was a Jew, right? Now, isn't it simple? Or if you look at it, just this one little phrase, Jewish Sabbath. Oh, and the papacy loves that statement. <laughs> they obviously never read Genesis. They were probably trained at Jesuit universities, right? So this tells us that immediately they want to introduce infidel theology and counter what it says in the plainest teachings of the Bible. All right. Now, this is very interesting. I was shown that if the truth Sabbath had been kept, there would never have been an infidel or an atheist. The observance of the Sabbath would have preserved the world from idolatry. Why, Martin? Because they would have believed God. Because the Sabbath is rooted in the Word of God and it's rooted in the creation week. And if you keep the Sabbath, what you are basically doing is acknowledging to the entire universe that you believe God rather than infidels. You know what? You can't, cannot put it better than you just put it. That's 100% all it is to it. You acknowledge God as a supreme authority. That's why you spent your time on the day that he is there to spend with you. Okay, so if you keep the Sabbath, will the geologist become irritated with you? Oh, yes. Will those that believe the geologist become irritated with you? Yes. All right, and if there are people within the church's ranks that believe the geologist over the word of God, will they become irritated with you? Yes. So this looks like a, a issue of conflict. Exactly. 100% what it is. And then that, that is what's creating this disguised infidelity. You sometimes don't even know that you're, you're busy with your infidelity. Yes, because you've swallowed some toxin which has uh, mutated into a monster in your mind. Mm. Now, Martin, this creation week, which serves as a model for everything that comes thereafter, the early church believed that it also serves as a model for the entire plan of salvation stretching over 6,000 years with the millennium of the seventh day representing the thousand years of rest. Mm. And that was called the Cosmic Week. Now, our modern theologians seem to have a tremendous aversion to the cosmic week, right? But that's what the early church fathers believed, and we did a whole study on mm -hmm. that in number nine already. Yeah. But for the sake of completeness, let's just take this thinking a little bit further. Yeah, and just to put it out there, bear with us, we, we're heading somewhere with this. Yes, <laughs> yes. All right, so let's have a look at some of the pioneers of the Advent movement. You had Wagoner from Eden to Eden and he quotes Revelation 21, 4 and 5. Eden is then fully restored. Here the river of water of life flows out from Mount Zion. Here Adam regains the tree of life planted beside the river which parts into separate heads as in the beginning. Here again is paradise, the garden which the Lord himself planted 7,000 years before. Uh, Martin, is that an interesting statement? So he's taking the whole yeah. creation week 
and changing it into a cosmic week. So the whole plan, the six days of labor, plus the seventh day millennium of rest, 7,000 years. Let's have a look what Thomas Preble had to say about the two Adams. Before the first Adam had the conflict with Satan, in which he fell, the seventh day or Sabbath had passed. So with the second Adam, before the last and final conflict with Satan and his hosts, in which eternal victory will be gained for the Son of God and his people, the Sabbath, or seven thousand years will be passed. Did they believe in the cosmic week? Well, actually, if you start, really study this, you cannot do any other. Did Ellen White believe it? Oh, for sure. Did God show it's her? everywhere. We've read previously how important it is to put your perspective into this 6,000 6, in prohibiting you from getting, becoming part of the infidels. And we read the statement from her grandson yeah. where he plainly stated that she was shown that this controversy would rage for 6,000 years and then there would be a millennium, right? Let's look at what Himes had to say, Signs of the Times, an expositor of prophecy. This was written in 1843. If then Jesus Christ does his work in six days and rests from all his labors on the seventh, when may we expect the great event to take place? I answer, if a thousand years is one day with the Lord, as I think I have proved, then six thousand years from the first creation, the new one must be formed. And moreover, if Christ worked after the example of his Father and rested as God rested from his labors, then the seven thousand years would be a Sabbath of rest for Christ and his people. So they all believed in this concept. But now if you deny the six thousand years, so if you want to accept the Septuagint as your standard and throw out what the Reformers used, namely the Masoretic text, mm. you are at loggerheads not only with the Bible, you're at loggerheads not only with the spirit of prophecy, you're at loggerheads with the early church fathers, and you're at loggerheads with uh, the pioneers of the Advent movement, right? Yeah. Clark. Advent Review and Errol, 1866. The Bible answers every query and solves every doubt. In this blessed book, the lover of history finds full information of past and future events. Beginning with the first Eden and reaching over a period of 7,000 years to the second Eden in the earth made new. Did he believe the 7,000 year period? They were so grounded in this that... The I think this shows how grounded they were in their Bible. Now, if these people live today, and our theologians and our biblical research institutes were to engage them, do you think there would be some fireworks? Oh, definitely. <laughs> definitely. <laughs> they wouldn't be on the same page, right? No. Okay. Josiah Litch, the first report of the General Conference of Christians Expecting the Advent of the Lord Jesus Christ. Interesting title, right? Yeah. It has been an almost universal opinion of the church, both Jewish and Christian, that the Sabbath prefigures a glorious state of rest for the church during the 7,000 years of the world. The principal argument in favor of this are briefly as follows. God made the world in six days, rested on the seventh, and constituted the Sabbath as a type of future rest. So we may expect that after the troubles and commotions of 6,000 years, there will be a rest of a thousand years from all these sorrows. Isn't it interesting that he also acknowledges here that basically the universal opinion of church Christian and Jews had yes. the same idea. Yes. Now, this is very interesting. So this is what the pioneers believed, right? Now, uh, if they were confronted with a 10,000-year argument, mm. as we have in many, many cases, uh, would they accept this? 
No. No. So what, what did they base it on? Were they influenced by the margin of the King James Version, all of them? Mm, they couldn't have been. Including the Spirit of Prophecy, was that influenced by the margin of the King James Version? No. No, but then why do our theologians say that it was? Because they tried to get out of this conflict. Okay, so on whose side are they now compromising? Unfortunately, not on the good side because... What is the little word that she used there on the side of the... Infidelity. <laughs> so, Martin, we come up against this problem of infidelity all the time. Martin, once you start questioning this, mm -hmm. then can't you start questioning the other things as well? Didn't you say that then you will start criticizing... Daniel, and you'll yes. start criticizing Revelation? Yes, you might consider Daniel and Revelation, or even the Bible, not sufficient to substantiate historical events. All right, so the very first story, once you start uh, manipulating that, then you have to manipulate all the other chapters which refer to it. Mm -hmm. Once you start manipulating that, you have to manipulate what Jesus referred to when he said, and the flood came and took them all away, because mm. that's not scientifically uh, tenable, right? Yes. Then you start working on the books of Daniel and Revelation. Now, these pioneers, were they rooted in the creation account? Definitely. Were they rooted, therefore, in the Sabbath? Yes. Were they, therefore, rooted in the cosmic week? Absolutely. All right. Now, none of our top theologians in the world and some of our supposed overseers would want to believe this. In fact, they would ridicule it. Mm -hmm. Now, if I chose to believe it, would I be an infidel? No. But according to them, yes. According to them. Would it become necessary to write articles in, in little magazines about it? Yes. Denigrating this viewpoint. And... You must remember, you'll have to get rid of the spirit of prophecy. You have to get rid of that prophet if, because the prophet's in line with us. All right, so this is a very serious issue. Mm. And, and the bottom line is, without trying to be too vociferous mm. about this issue, is who do we believe? Do we believe the plain statements in the Word of God, which are corroborated by equally plain statements in the spirit of prophecy? Or do we believe our theologians and our, our scientists out there that have come to the point of compromise with infidelity. Mm. Hmm? So what can we say to them? What can I say to them? Because there are now two viewpoints, and never the twain shall meet. So all I can say is get over it. Try and get over it, because you will not twist my mind back into believing what I believed when I was an infidel atheist. That's it. When he said, if you want to believe in those gods and that, those nonsense that they put there, do it. But if you want to follow the God of the Bible, you have to start believing what he says. All right, so let's see where this leads. Now, this was a while ago already, in 2021. Prominent professor from LLU and uh, Martin... These professors are very prominent theologians in our ranks. Mm. And the interesting thing is they become so prominent that they become deans, so their, their voice is very uh, important in terms of what they are stating. Right? And it's sad, they, they're teachers. There's other people that are being taught, leaders that are being taught by these people. Yes. So, Dr. John Pauline is a professor at the Loma Linda University School of Religion at a recent church-sponsored symposium about the end-time prophetic events. Dr. Pauline said that Sunday laws are not coming. The great controversy is outdated. There are other options for the mark of the beast, and Ellen White was not an end-time prophet. The biblical evidence does not speak of Sunday as such, but it speaks about a counterfeit of the Sabbath being critical to the mark of the beast at the end of time. So within exegesis of the biblical text, you do have options for understanding what the mark of the beast will actually turn out to be. 
We should be careful not to assume that the end time will be identical to the great controversy in every detail. Just to make clear, this great controversy is the book, The Great Controversy, written by Alan White. Correct. So this is a direct contradiction of the spirit of prophecy. Now, do you see the leadership climbing onto the bandwagon condemning these people? No. No. But if somebody says, I believe the great controversy in every detail, and I believe what it says about Catholicism, and I believe what the Reformers believed on the very same issue, then they will make a big hue and cry about it, right? Mm. So whose side are they on? Infidelity or the Bible and the spirit of prophecy? By own choosing, infidelity. Considering both the Bible and world history, were Ellen White alive today, there is at least a chance that her depiction of the end time would be different than it was in the 1880s. I thought, I am the Lord, I change not. Mm. Ellen White's style of prophecy is classical rather than apocalyptic. Martin, this is playing with words, this is semantics. To make of none effect that which is very plain. Is that not a, one of the last means that Satan will bring about the shaking? Absolutely. And finally, as a classical prophet, Ellen White's predictions should be understood as conditional. As circumstances change, the fulfillment of revelation could take other forms than the ones that seemed so clear in 1888. So this man is casting serious doubt upon the writings of Ellen G. White. And even the Bible, because he says the mark of the beast are also totally different from what we believed it to be. Yes. Now, Martin, we're just reading this in an article from the Advent Messenger, and some people will say, well, maybe they're exaggerating, right? These are his own words. These are his own words, yes. But I have had personal experience with a man. I've sat face to face with this man. And he told me in no uncertain terms that uh, I was not to preach about the papacy, that it was the Antichrist. Although the spirit of prophecy says, uh, expose the wickedness of the man of sin. He also told me many other things. He told me that people that come into the church through ministries like ours that uh, believe the things that stand in the Bible and the spirit of prophecy are not welcome in the church. Mm -hmm. But it seems that people with his ideas are not only welcome, but placed on a pedestal. Mm. Is there something seriously wrong in Israel? Definitely. I think it's time to reread Ezekiel 8, as yes. we've said in the previous episode. And so when our leading organizations start writing articles against those who preach the Bible in the spirit of prophecy and accommodate individuals like this within the church without a peep, isn't there something seriously wrong all the way into those echelons as well? Mm -hmm. So let's put it on the table. I'm not condemning anyone, but it is a question of who do we believe. And if we are... Seventh-day Adventists at all, then we must be rooted in what made this church what it is and who laid the groundwork for what we believe. Who laid the foundation? Now, Martin, if the foundation is wrong, the building cannot stand. Wasn't it the pioneers? Yes. And wasn't, when they couldn't go any further, wasn't it corroborated and substantiated by the spirit of prophecy? Correct. And now, who are these people to tear down mm -hmm. those foundations? Because if they tear at the foundations, they are tearing at the very structure of the building. And they are at loggerheads with the Bible. Yes. They are not in harmony with the Bible, the spirit of prophecy, the pioneers. Neither are they in harmony with the reformers. Mm. In as far as the, ref the reform reformers had light on the issues. All right, so according to these learned gentlemen who have drunken from the wells of infidelity, there is no Sunday movement. The great controversy is wrong. The papacy has nothing to do with it. There will be no image to the beast and there will be no implementation of the mark of the beast. 
Isn't that what he said? Mm -hmm. Okay. Here is an article from Desert News. Could Sabbath closure laws make a comeback? Pandemic-related stress and a widespread desire for more time to rest are amongst the factors fueling the Great Resignation. They also help explain why some political commentators and legal scholars spent the weekend debating the Sabbath. Uh, who, Martin? Political commentators and legal scholars. Mm -hmm. The conversation began with a tweet from Adrian Vermeil, a law professor at Harvard University. He highlighted the reinstatement of Sabbath laws as one of several policy goals that unites post-liberals, a group of conservatives who say they're focused on promoting the common good. Martin, where have you heard that word, the common good? The papacy and Jesuits love that word. So it's a, a Jesuit phrase. Mm -hmm. So are we dealing with Catholicism and its thinking and the legal world of the world? Okay. Blue laws associated with the Christian Sabbath helps explain why part of the debate surrounding Vermeule's tweet centered on religious discrimination. Legal experts pointed out that forced closures on Sunday disproportionately harm some people of faith, including Jews who observe the Sabbath, from sundown on Friday to sundown on Saturday. In May 1961, the Supreme Court ruled 8 to 1, that Maryland's Sabbath laws didn't violate the First Amendment. The justices acknowledged that the restrictions had their root in Christian practice, but said they served important secular purposes, including the promotion of public health, IS reported. Now, Martin, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. So we are dealing with a conflict between two Sabbaths. That's it. The biblical one and this <laughs> Christian one. That they... Child of the papacy, <laughs> let's call it by its real name. And the mark of the beast is Sunday observance because Rome has identified it as such. It is a mark, the fact that we have transferred the solemnity of the biblical Sabbath to the first day of the week is a mark of our ecclesiastical authority. The church is above the Bible. That is so arrogant, but it comes straight from the horse's mouth, Catholicism. And here we have a debate taking place about whether Sunday could be enforced in the place of the Sabbath day. Yes, and according to the court, it is legal. Ah, Martin, but is it lawful? Not according to the Bible. Because if you take the instance of Nebuchadnezzar, even though it was for implementing a law for God, that's not how God works. Correct. So when Nebuchadnezzar accepted that the God of Daniel was the true God, he made a law that nobody may worship anyone else than this true God. Mm. And he was overstepping his bounds because God never forces the conscience. So whether you're doing it on the side of the right or whether you're doing it on the side of the wrong, you may not force mm. the conscience. So here's another article, and this one from Christianity Today, which is a very prominent mouthpiece, from February the 4th, 2022. Amazon primes a Sunday work dilemma. So Amazon is this company that is using every day of the week to distribute its wares or deliver them. With two delivery drivers suing over schedules, Sabbatarian Christians find their observance increasingly countercultural in a 24-7 economy. Now Martin, this is very confusing. Because when they talk about Sabbatarian Christians, they're talking about Sunday. Yeah. They're not talking about the seventh day, they're talking about the first day. They'll name them by name, the, either Jews or Seventh-day Adventists, if they're talking about the other. Christians have lamented the shift away from businesses observing Sunday Sabbath for decades. 
In Christianity today's early days, evangelical leaders complained about the uptick in open on Sunday, signs in grocery stores, theaters, and other businesses. Too largely, the Sabbath day has been reduced from a holy day of spiritual replenishment, instruction, and correction to a mere holiday for pleasure-seeking, or to just another day of merchandising. Charles W. Collar, President Emeritus of Northern Baptist Theological Seminary, wrote in 1963, two years after the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that blue laws restricting Sunday commerce were constitutional. There we have it again. Mm -hmm. So they're debating whether to bring these laws back, right? Mm -hmm. Christ made allowance within the spirit of the law for works of mercy and of necessity and for taking care of the occasional ox and the dish, Collis said. But the moral responsibility of unnecessary Sabbath violation is not to be lightly regarded. Immeasurably greater is the moral responsibility of coaxing others away from Sabbath observance to the mart of trade. Still more serious is the policy of denying the employees the possibility of observing the Sabbath. So they're raising their voices, but they've got their Sabbath confused. It's not rooted in the Word of God, it's rooted in a foul foundation which is situated at the Vatican. And they want to use secular power to enforce this. Yes. Here's another article from Religion Unplugged. And this one comes from February the 11th, 2022. Not just nostalgia. Some pandemic-weary souls want to make Sunday a day of rest again. Some of us are old enough to remember when most businesses, not just Chick-fil-A, Closed on Sundays, it seems quaint now, but I did an Associated Press story in 2003 on family Christian stores. Then the nation's largest Christian retail chain deciding to open on Sundays. But in 2016, I was surprised during the reporting trip to North Dakota when I found an empty parking lot at the Bismarck Walmart and then at Super Target while looking to buy a few snacks and supplies before Sunday morning church. I learned that for more than a century, the state had required most retailers to close from midnight to noon on Sundays. North Dakota finally became the last state to lift that ban in 2019. I bring up this subject not just for nostalgia, but because the day of rest or lack of it is drawing renewed consideration nationally. Martin, are they beginning to debate the Sunday issue? Mm -hmm. This is brewing. But John Pauline said it's not going to happen. It's not part of the book of Revelation and Ellen White is outdated. Now Martin, here's another article. And this one comes from February the 17th, 2022. Build Blue Laws Back. Now we're using the slogan, Build Back Better, right? Mm -hmm. Scripture tells us that God created humans on the sixth day, and after that arduous effort, God himself rested on the seventh day. And God tells us that humans need to rest on the seventh day, the Sabbath, too. For the first couple of hundred years that Christians lived on North American continent, they kept observing the Sabbath as they had done in the old country. The Sabbath was ordained by ecclesiastical authorities and eventually enforced by secular governments in America through a series of statutes that came to be known as Blue Laws. Now, Martin is quite right here. It was ordained by ecclesiastical authorities. Yes, the, the Sabbath that they're talking about, is ex that's exactly how it came about. But it wasn't ordained of God. No, because if they're talking about the real Sabbath, and it's interesting, I'll come back to that point now, but it's interesting that they continue to say on the seventh day, but Sunday is not the seventh day. They are totally confused. So then they bring it in that um, God said rest on that day, but they say here that ecclesiastical authorities 
ordained it. So all earth confused theologians that don't believe any of these things should join these and they can at least all be equally confused, right? <laughs> what was life on the Sabbath like under blue laws? Well, it meant that Sundays were quieter, set apart from the other six days of the week. Proponents of ending blue laws in past decades argued that the Sunday Sabbath could be a movable feast and that it could be observed on any day of the week. But that missed the point, which was that to benefit one and all and to be predictable for planning purposes, everything had to halt on a Sunday. Of course, another benefit was that church attendance would increase. The benefits of blue laws ultimately outweigh any temporary or minor downsides. And politicians may find that campaigning to establish a truly restful and refreshing weekend will be a hit at the polls this fall. What? Is this becoming a political issue? I think it is definitely becoming political. And the conservative right will definitely be looking at this. Well, they'd love to climb onto this bandwagon. All right. So now let's look how far we are going. Here comes an article from Earthbeat, also from February 17, 2022. As Build Back Better Stalls, faith leaders call Biden Senate to moment for courage on climate. Hmm, that's very interesting. Let's read. Nearly 100 faith leaders have called on President Joe Biden and Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer to not abandon Democrats' sprawling Build Back Better agenda and its hundreds of billions of dollars to combat climate change, saying this is a moment for courage, as the bill has stalled and fallen behind other legislative priorities. We cannot delay in acting the Build Back Better Act. This vital legislation will protect our climate and put our nation on a path of climate justice, environmental justice, and intergenerational justice. Martin, this is interesting. If you remember, quite a while back, we did that episode on what that buzzwords, climate justice, environmental justice, and all of this, it goes back to Sunday, Sunday legislation. A coalition of 86 faith leaders of national, state and local faith-based organizations and congregations wrote in a letter February 14 addressed to Biden, Schumer and the full U.S. Senate, we share a moral call to care for our common home, God's creation and to love our neighbors both here and around the world, the faith leaders said. Now, Martin, if these are the buzzwords that come straight out of Laudato Si, and it couples it back to God's creation, mm -hmm. does Laudato Si couple it to Sunday? Yes, directly. Yeah. Directly. Yeah. Now, here you have faith leaders, 100 faith leaders, coupling it directly with the creation. They don't speak about Sabbath in particular, but they say we share a moral call to care for our common home, God's creation, and to love our neighbors, both here and around the world. And Laudato Si made it quite plain that Sunday was for our common good and for love your neighbor and for our common home. And they had that week of prayer for the Sabbath that linked to climate change. So we've had faith leaders appealing directly to Biden to build back better and to put Creation Week back into the picture. That means putting Laudato Si mm -hmm. into operation. We've had faith leaders from the evangelical world having a week of prayer for the introduction of the Sabbath. We've had articles that we've just read where they argue for the reinstating of blue laws. Are our theologians fast asleep or are they drinking from the wells of infidelity? If they are fast asleep, we are encouraging them to please wake up. And if they are drinking from that cup of Babylonian wine, please refrain from it. 
Okay, I'm wondering, Martin, whether they're sticking to wine or whether they've put moonshine in there to have something stronger in order to be able to come up with some of these statements. Let's wrap this up, Martin, with a statement from the Spirit of Prophecy from the book Great Controversy, which our friend the theologian says is outdated and needs to be redefined. The dignitaries of church and state will unite to bribe, persuade, or compel all classes to honor the Sunday. The lack of divine authority will be supplied by oppressive enactments. Martin, have they been practicing this over the last two years? Definitely, and that's also included in blue laws. Political corruption is destroying love of justice and regard for truth, and even in free America, rulers and legislators, in order to secure public favor, will yield to the popular demand for a law-enforcing Sunday observance. Martin, is there a popular demand? Definitely. You've got faith leaders even, and the populace. And are they praying for the implementation thereof? Liberty of conscience, which has cost so great a sacrifice, will no longer be respected. Well, they've practiced that now for a year, so maybe they've got it right now. In the soon coming conflict, we shall see exemplified the prophet's words. The dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Martin, they have the testimony. Unfortunately, not all seem to believe the testimony. But the Bible says to the law and and the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, there is no light in them. So my appeal is to those who want to believe what God said, then start from the beginning. Look at the book of Genesis. Look at the plan of salvation. Look at the roots for the Sabbath day. Look at the war against the Sabbath day. Daniel and Revelation, he will change he will think to change times and laws. He has done precisely this. He calls it the mark of his ecclesiastical authority. He's got the faith leaders clamoring for it, for the reinstating of the blue laws. And our people are saying the time is not yet. Martin, when are we going to wake up? We have to do it right now. Because there's a loud cry to be given to get people out of Babylon. And let's pray for these theologians Absolutely. and for these leading figures that deny the very basics of the Advent faith. And let's pray that they wake up and embrace the truth before it is too late. And that applies to every single one of us. Who do we believe? Do we believe that thus says the Lord? Or do we believe the infidels? of the scientific world, all the infidels that have become intoxicated with the wine that is being passed around, not only by the Church of Rome, but by all who have imbibed in that particular drink. May God spare us, because he says, we have to come out of her, lest we receive her plagues. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, this war has been raging from the beginning. It starts with the very first sentence in the Bible, in the beginning God, where the devil says no. There were many, many creations and none of these things described in the Bible actually took place. And twists and distorts everything else until finally the seventh day becomes the first day. How did that happen, Lord? Unless there was an infidel at work. Help us to expose the wickedness of the man of sin and to rely on the thus says the word that we may stand in that great day is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.